Okay, uh, this is David Suckling. Uh, I'm Connie Rufner, the interviewer, and David Suckling is our narrator. Uh, Mr. Suckling, thank you for your service. You're quite welcome. Um, so how, how old are you? 88. 88? <clears throat> yes. And you said you served in uh, World War II and you lived through the Great Depression both? Yes, I did. So I was born in 1924, and uh, the Great Depression started in 29, so I was five years old when it started. Do you remember very much about it? I do, from 1930 on. Do you? I don't remember much about it when I was four or five years old. But you wouldn't, from when you were about six, you remember? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, did your family have a hard time during the Depression? Yes, but we were fortunate because my father didn't lose his job. He was, uh, he worked in the offices for the Pittsburgh and Shawmut Railroad Company, and he worked in the maintenance of way department. In fact, he was a maintenance away department, so he didn't lose his job. However, he took one pay cut after another till it was very hard going. He had built a house and was paying for it. And I can remember those years quite clearly. So how many children were in your family? One. Just you? Just me. Mm. So his pay kept getting cut and cut? Yes. Did he talk about it at all? How did you know? Did they tell you? At the dinner table there were just the three of us. So they talked? And they talked. And I was all ears. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you went to school in Catanning? Yes, I did. Class of 1942. Did you walk to school? Yes. Walked to school. Which school did you go to? Uh, Catanning Public School, uh, and all, gr all grades up one through high school. So 12. And is that the school that's still over here, the central school? <clears throat> that's where the school was. It's not the same building? It, no, it's the same building. Is it really? But, okay. But it, uh, there, was a, there were two buildings and one burnt down. Yeah, I remember that. Mm-hmm. And the one that's left burnt somewhat in 1965, I believe it was. <clears throat> My mother taught there, and I remember standing on the street corner with her, watching the building with her precious art room, she taught art, oh. burning up, and she was crying. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember your mother. Oh, do you? She was a wonderful teacher. Yeah, she loved to teach. Mm -hmm. My wife was a teacher also. And she taught in the business department shorthand, uh, typing, sales, that sort of thing, yeah. When did you get married? Now there's a good question. 1953. So it was after the war? It was after the war, yes. Did you know her before you left? Yes. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, she uh, was uh, living with my parents when I came back from the war. Oh, so was she your sweetheart then? No, not then. Ah. She was my kid sister. Ah. Sort of, at that point in life. Mm -hmm. But as time went on, I discovered she was a pretty nice girl. And one thing led to another, and uh, we fell in love, got married. 1953, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And she was a teacher, and what did you do? I was a lawyer. Oh. For 55 years I practiced law. 
Okay. <clears throat> and uh, most of that was by myself. In, in later years, I teamed up with Ken Valasek, now uh -huh. Judge Valasek. Uh -huh. And uh, we practiced law together for till he became judge. And then did you retire when he became a judge? No, I retired in 2002. Uh, and I never really took two or three years cleaning up de details mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before I could really say I was done. That's a lot of years of paperwork to clear up. Yeah, that was a lot of years. Yeah. Now, when did you go to law school? Was that after the war? I went to law school, let me think, after the war, yes. So when did you when did you leave to go? When were you were you drafted or did you volunteer? Well, it was a little bit of both. Uh, um, I was scheduled to be drafted in February. I forget that year now. And my father had already paid for my first year at the University of Pittsburgh and he went to the draft board and said uh, uh, if you let him go to June we won't ask for a deferment mm -hmm. because I, I was a pre-medical, pre-dental student and I was entitled to be deferred mm -hmm. but I didn't want to be deferred with all my buddies going to the, off to war. Yeah. <clears throat> so the draft board made a deal with him that they would hold me at home until June when I got out of school. At, that was my first year at Pitt, University of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And it worked that way. As soon as I got out of school in June, I was off to the war. Where did you go for basic training? Never had basic training. Oh, where did you go first then? Where was the first place you went? Well, I, the, the train full of us left Catanning amidst the whole mob of people up at the old station. You know, and we went to uh, for for a couple of days to a camp. I don't remember the name of it in the east. And then after a couple of days, I was sent to Camp Miles Standish. That's Miles M Y L E S. Miles Standish, which was 20 miles from Boston. Oh. And it was a port of embarkation. It was a port. Troops were coming in. I thought it was amusing at the time. All these British troops were coming in to, from England to our port and then on to the South Pacific. And the American troops were coming from California <laughs> off to England. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> First taste of the army. <laughs> <laughs> Not the most efficient plan. <laughs> no. So did you did you go to England or did you go to the South Pacific? I went to England. Was that before D Day? Pardon me? Was that before D Day? Um oh yes. D Day was the end of the war. So how long were you in England? About two weeks. I was on my way to the front lines. Okay, okay. <clears throat> and then where did you go after that? Where did they send you? Went on a boat from Southampton to Omaha Beach. 
which was just two months after the D-Day. Uh-huh. And I got to see all the wreckage there. They yeah. removed all the bodies, but everything else was intact, like. And uh, from there went to a, uh, a group of us to a camp, and there we were parceled out in open trucks to different units all along from uh, Holland clear down through to Luxembourg. So I was infantry replacement without ever having had a day of basic training. With no training at all? No. Wow. Did you, did you know how to shoot a rifle before that? Oh, oh yeah. Boys in my age, we all knew how to shoot rifles. They had BB guns. Mm -hmm. Learned to shoot with the BB guns, really. The only difference with the rifle was the kick. Were you a hunter before that? I gave that up when I was 17. I, when I killed my last rabbit and I said, That's, I'll not do this again. I couldn't do that anymore. But, uh, yeah, I, I did it by share of hunting. Just just a little bit. Uh, wasn't a rabbit hunter. Mm -hmm. I was a rabbit, rabbit hunter, but not a rabbit hunter. <laughs> <laughs> so you went, did you go to Holland or to Luxembourg or did, where were you then? Well, <clears throat> I went to England on the Queen Elizabeth with 15,000 other soldiers and it ran alone because it could outrun the submarine pack. Oh. See, its top speed was like uh, 39 knots. So that's over 40 miles an hour. And uh, landed in Glasgow Harbor on a train immediately to the south of uh, England and a couple of days later on a boat for three days crossing the 26 mile channel. And uh, from there we, we were a group of replacements. From there we went into the woods in uh, uh, Holland. Mm -hmm. Were you in the Battle of the Bulge? Yes. Were you? Yes. Although I was lucky. I was in the 104th Infantry Division, the so-called Wolf. It's, it's uh, insignia was a howling wolf's head. Timberwolf. Ah. So-called Timberwolf Division. And I was sent in, they were in Holland, in the British Army. And I went in there as a replacement, one of the first replacements they'd, they had. They'd only been in, at the front for three weeks. Shortly thereafter, the whole division was shipped by open truck down to uh, Aachen, Elisabel, Aachen, the first city on the border of, of uh, what, what's that country? Belgium? Germany? No, the Aachen is Germany. Is it Germany? And that's the, it's the one that's spelled A-A-C-H-E-N? Belgium, A -A Belgium, Belgium, yes. Okay. Yeah. Aachen. Uh -huh. The first division had been in Aachen for some weeks and they were exhausted because it was a major city. <clears throat> so we replaced the first division with our 104th division one night, unit by unit. Uh -huh. And with all the 
the uh, secrecy of warfare. Next morning on the loudspeakers, the Germans said, Welcome to Germany, 104th Division from Holland. <laughs> <laughs> Not much of a secret. <laughs> no. No. In perfect English. <laughs> Did you guys laugh? Or? Yeah, of course we laughed. <laughs> you know, we were the, the dog faces, uh, the infantry riflemen, and we were a cynical bunch. We had to be in that yeah. order to survive. Yeah. So was it fighting house to house in Aachen? Yes. Was indeed. Yeah. Actually, actually, Stolberg. Stolberg was a uh, not Augen, Augen General. It would be like uh, Aspenwall is to Pittsburgh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You know. Mm hmm. Not quite a suburb, more like a little town. That yes, sort more of like part a of town, sort of little town. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, I, of course, was just a foot soldier, private first class. Without one day's training as a foot soldier, I played the trumpet in the ba in the band when I went in. The oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So how did you do? How did I do? Yeah, that must have been. Did I, you feel? I mean, did you feel confused, like you didn't know what to do, or did you? Oh no, I survived. I I had been put. I was in what they called the Army Specialist Training Corps, mm -hmm. a bunch of boys that they yanked out of the, and sent off to college because I had a high IQ. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and of course, uh, that was purely a voluntary thing, it wasn't in my case. I, I just got transferred there. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's a side story in itself. I won't get into it. Well, well to make it simple, after I got put into the band, then I got interviewed by three majors along with some other fellows. And I said, uh, I wanted to go back to the band. And the uh, uh, boss interviewer said, I can't keep you here because this Army Tr Specialist Training Corps is all volunteers. Mm -hmm. But I can assure you that where I'm going to send you is not back to the band and you're not going to like it. <laughs> so, so he had me. I sent right to England. He, he had me, that put me in the infantry. <laughs> <laughs> so my first day in the infantry, I, I was shipped along with some other guys by train. We were in the train for a week. It went from New York, it went to Canada, it came back to the United States, it went south. We wondered where in the heck are we going? And it finally stopped in the woods of Louisiana. And they emptied the train, took us to Camp Polk. And overnight, and there we were taught how to roll a full field pack and given a rifle, and uh, the next day they took us out into the woods and parceled us out to the 75th 
No. To the 104th Division, I'd been in the 75th. Uh, three guys here, two guys there, and so forth, and all of a sudden I was an infantry soldier. My credentials were I play trumpet. So did you did you ever actually play the trumpet then while you were in? I played in a camp band in when I first went into the army up in Boston. Had a ball. Uh huh. I was playing with professionals, you know, and I was holding my own. And uh, I thought, oh, this this is too good to be true. I'm going to spend the war playing in a professional quality band and I got to play in the dance band sat between two guys who played in all the big dance bands learned a lot from them but I only did that for a couple of months and I got yanked out and sent to college because of my score on the uh -huh. army test so uh, I was very unhappy about that. I didn't want to go to college. They sent me to City College in New York. How long were you there? Six months. One December night, uh, an orderly came into the room where 22 of us were packed, sleeping, and said, Get your stuff together, you're moving out. We, we said, what? <laughs> Get your stuff together, you're moving out. When? Now. So, uh, we got out in a snowstorm. They took us to um, the docks. And I was on Queen Elizabeth on my way to the war. Wow. And as I say, my credentials were I played a pretty good trumpet. <laughs> 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 so you wound up in Aachen after all that. Yeah. And then did you, did you, I mean, did you continue going on into Germany with the rest of the army? Yes. Yes, I was found that I was in the 104th Timberwolf Division, L Company, and uh, I was in the 3rd Squad of the 3rd Platoon of Company L. And uh, one of the first forays in to Stolberg, the next little town, uh, try to take Stolberg. Those of us who got back from that uh, terrible mistake, uh, I discovered I was company L. Or, or, I was the only one left. Oh. So. Uh, what was it that you said it was a terrible mistake? What was it that happened? Well, the Germans let us occupy the buildings. This was in broad daylight. And then they just overwhelmed us with numbers. And out of sheer luck, I got out of, uh, I escaped as did a few others, but not many. So I discovered after that that I was the third squad in the third platoon of our company. Until a couple of months later, we got some replacements. Did you, did you like, did you work with another squad while you were waiting for people to come? Yes. Yeah, I hooked on to the second squad 
which was run by a buddy of mine. And he asked the platoon sergeant if I could tag along with him. And he said I could, so I did. What was the highest rank you had while you were in the Army? Private first class. So you were a private the whole way through? Yes. Well, that's a little complicated too because for some time I was a squad leader but as a private, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as was my buddy mm -hmm. Schwartz. He had a second squad, I had a third squad, strictly by attrition. Right, right. Yeah. There wasn't anybody else left in the third squad but me and then when they got a few replacements they followed me because they didn't know what they were doing and, and I became the squad leader by default. And uh, one day the uh, sergeant came to me and said what we didn't understand was the Battle of the Bulge had started just 10 miles south of us. Of course, we didn't have newspapers or anything, we didn't know of it. All we knew was the Germans suddenly disappeared in front of us. And the squad uh, platoon leader, two sergeants, came to me and said, I'm sending you th three squad leaders. There two per privates first class and one uh, corporal sending you to the rest camp in Verbier, Belgium for six days because we didn't know what had happened. Yeah, all, right. All right. we knew was the Germans disappeared from in front of us because they'd all been pulled back for the Battle of the Bulge. So they figured you might as well get a rest while you could? That's what they thought, exactly. And. The three days ended up to be six hours because uh, we know uh, I did get a change of clothes and a shower, thank God, and something to eat. And the three of us, the three squad leaders from my platoon. Uh, we decided to walk down the street from the building we were building it in an old school. Mm -hmm. And it was really eerie because we just came out of hell and here was a city just 40 kilometers back from the front and the streetcars were going and people were going to work and people were going to the store. And it just wasn't really, you know, it was surreal. Just 40 kilometers back. And completely normal. And completely normal. The only th thing that abnormal was every once in a while a buzz bomb would go over head and when it, everything stopped because they didn't know when it was coming down. And it would come down somewhere else and explode, you'd hear it. And then everything was returned to normal. It was a very surrealistic episode. Yeah. But my stay there was six hours and not three days because the Battle of the Bulge had started and they didn't know where it was going to hit next. So the MPs swept the town, got all of us who back up, got, gave us back our tin hats and our rifles and trucked us back up to the front all night long while the German airplanes were trying to find us dropping flares. Uh, when they'd hear the German 
German airplanes in the sky. Then they, they'd stop the whole convoy. Convoy ran without any lights, none at all. I have to hand it to those black boys. They were all, the Transportation Corps drivers were all black boys. And they could drive, and they had guts. And when they'd hear the German planes overhead, they'd stop and cut the motors and be still. One little incident there, and my, my, the trucks were open trucks. We were packed in the back. So they heard a German plane. We assumed it was German because they were the only airplanes flying. I, it always amused me in later years when I'd read about the, the, the Air Force was grounded for three days because of bad weather. Well, that didn't bother the German planes. They weren't grounded. I can attest to that. So, anyway, uh, the, the convoy w would stop. They cut the motors. They were running without lights anyway. And wait until that plane disappeared. Could hear it circling. It would drop flares trying to see to the ground, but it didn't find us. It never caught us. And as soon as we got it back up front, we got parceled out back into our own units again. And uh, then the war continued for me. So where did you wind up at the end of the war? About... I wound up in a little village that we had taken called Lucherburg on the banks of the Roar River, which is a tributary of the, the uh, Rhine. Oh, okay. And uh, by then my feet were so bad I didn't really realize they were so bad until I went to that rest camp. Uh -huh. During that six hours, I got a shower, and I got clean, used clothing. I got a pair of British soldiers' pants, because uh, I was com completely ill-dressed and shod for the winter. My shoes were uh, manufactured for the the campaign in North Africa, so they were turned inside out uh -huh, uh -huh. with the rough leather on the outside uh -huh, uh -huh. so that the tropical sun from North Africa would not be Overheat reflected that. in my face. But turned the wrong side out and where I was standing in a mud foxhole for a day or two, they just absorbed the, the water and the mud. Oh. Every once in a while I'd be able to take them off. Uh -huh. I had to take a pen knife out of my pocket and scrape the congealed mud out of the inside because mud and all seeped through that leather. That's what did in my feet. So did you have I mean, did you get infected blisters? No, I had frozen feet. Oh, it was frostbite. Frostbite, and trench foot both. Uh -huh. But I kept stumping along when uh, the Battle of the Bulge started, and we didn't know where. All we knew was the Germans just disappeared in front of us, and the three of us went to the rest camp where we got shower and clean 
used clothing, and they took our weapons and our steel hats, and we walked down into the city where, I, as I said a minute ago, I think I was amazed at life as usual. Mm -hmm. That close to the front lines, 40 kilometers, that's something like 35 miles. Streetcars going and women going shopping and I just stepped out of hell into another world, you know, it was very strange. But the three of us found a USO canteen and we went in there and sat for an hour, maybe two, drinking coffee and eating donuts and exchanging stories with the other soldiers. And when we went to leave, when I stood up, I couldn't stand the pain in my feet. I said, hobbled out onto the street and I said, there's something really wrong with my feet because I can hardly stand the pain. <coughs> So I gave them the little bit of Flemish money that I had, and God knows where I got it, and said, you guys go have a good time. I'll try to get back up to the camp. And I uh, hobbled along for a little while, and I sit on a curb, and then I hobble a little farther and sit on a curb. and. Uh, the Flemish people, bless them, they kept trying to put me on a streetcar. And I wasn't about to get on a streetcar in the city. I didn't know where I was. <laughs> so I made it about halfway back up the hill to the camp when a P, uh, jeep came down with uh, police mm -hmm. in it, the, the army police. They say get back up to the camp immediately. Yeah. This was uh, December the 19th, I think. Well, the Battle of the Balls had started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was December 16th. And the Army was just catching up to it. Three days later. They, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, as soon as I got back in the back in the truck in the cold at night time with my feet on the cold metal, they got numb. And as long as they were numb, I could walk. Mm -hmm. So I put in another some weeks stumping along with the numb feet until my buddy who had the, the second squad, I had the third squad, tattled to the platoon sergeant that there was something wrong with my feet. And uh, he came and said, what's wrong with your feet? And I said, I don't, I don't know, they're numb. When they're numb, they don't hurt. If I get them warm, they're painful. He said, well, I'm sending you to the aid station so you can take a look at them. So my two buddies were, took me to the aid station in a little town back of the line is about a mile. And uh, there the doctor, army doctor, took off my socks and shoes, and got a needle and started to work from my big toe up. He got about halfway up my shin before I could feel the needle. Oh my. And he said, oh, you're going back. 
I thought he meant back up to the front. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't know he meant back home. So that put me into the hospital system, which eventually brought me back home. So did your feet get better? What happened? The feet have never been normal. Uh-huh. As we talk right now, they're ice cold. But, uh, you know, I've, I've learned to live with that. Were you in the hospital for a long time? Seven months. Oh my. Yeah. Five different hospitals. Interesting side. In that trip from the front line to a aid station in Belgium to an army hospital in Wales to an army hospital in um, New Jersey to an army hospital in North Carolina. Every one of those hospitals that I went through in that journey, when they took my case history, they said, do you smoke? And I said, no. And they said, did you ever smoke? And I said, no. And they said, good. You have a better chance of your feet recovering. Back then, the Army knew that smoking constricted capillaries. And that was amazing in later years when people got, you know, we tell mm -hmm. people don't smoke. Mm -hmm. It's bad for your health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you already knew. I already knew that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I didn't smoke probably saved my two feet. Because I was in a ward. There were 50,000 of us suffering from trench foot. Oh out of that. Yeah, 50,000. There were more casualties from that than there were from the Germans. Wow. Wow. And that's because we were improperly shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was winter and you were standing in mud the whole time? I was in uh, freezing mud the whole time. And all I had on was a pair of long johns, a winter shirt, and a sweater, and a field jacket, unlined field jacket. Totally unprepared for the, the winter. Got used to just being freezing cold, but the thing about the feet, the, the, the soon it's they were freezing cold and they didn't hurt anymore. Yeah, yeah. And I could stump along with them. I couldn't feel them. But I could stump, I couldn't run. But as soon as I started to get warm, which was not very often, then they'd start to hurt like the devil. Did a lot of the guys who had trench foot, did a lot of them lose their feet? Yes. They had us wards of nothing but trench foot. Uh, and we were all lying there with our bare feet sticking out because there was nothing they could do for it. Nature had to rebuild the circulation system in our feet. Nearly everybody smoked. We had one incident on a truck convoy in the dark, running without any lights at all, trying to get us back up to the front 
after the Battle of Bald started, in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. clear night, and the German planes were active, buzzing around, dropping flares, trying to see who they could catch on the ground. But as soon as they'd hear the buzz of an airplane, they know it was German. And the convoy would stop dead. He was running without any headlights anyway. And everybody was told to just be still. At which point a guy in my truck decided to strike a match to smoke a cigarette. And if you've ever had any experience out in the wild, in the dark at night, somebody strikes matches like a bonfire just went up. I think all 20-some guys in the truck jumped on him, and I never dreamt of Oh, how many years later is that? Seventy? Years later, I'd be sitting here telling you that story. Do you remember, uh, do you remember the, do you remember the end of the, de uh, the end of the war? I mean, did you go to a celebration? Do you, did you hear I was radio? in the, I was in an Army hospital in Camp uh -huh. Butner, North Carolina. And we, we were all crippled. There wasn't any celebration other than hollering and whooping and uh -huh. so forth. Uh, so, no, there wasn't any in that army hospital. There wasn't any planned mm -hmm. thing. Did you hear? How did you hear about it? Oh, in the Army Hospital, we, we had newspapers, radios, so we heard about the war being over, which was good news to all of us because that meant that we were going to get out of the Army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it also meant that we made it. Do you still keep in touch with any of your buddies from that time? No. No, the, in all honesty, they came and went so fast, and it was just, in my case, the three squad leaders, we were all privates. Mm -hmm. uh, and I lost track of them. The three of us were close mm -hmm. because the other guys came and went and came and went and mm -hmm. came and went. We were still there. We were the three squad leaders. Honestly, sometimes I wouldn't know the names of the guys in my squad. They'd be there today, the first day at the front, and they'd be gone. That happened often. They didn't know when to duck. Yeah. Uh, mm hmm And I could tell by the sound of an artillery shell long before it landed, I could tell where, whether it was going to be close to me or somewhere else. So you knew when to duck. And I was already down. Yeah. That's part of the way you survived. Uh, well, that's about my story as a, Thank you so much. As a foot soldier. Thank you so You're welcome. Much. You probably won't interview too many who were actually foot soldiers in the front lines. The survival rate wasn't very good. There are some here and there. Uh, for some weeks I had been the third squad and the third platoon all by myself. And then we got some some uh, replacements. 
came in, I think there were five of them. And uh, the only friend I had left was the medic, our medic. And shortly after we got these replacements, they moved to my company. This is the movements by foot, you know, yeah, how the infantry walked. Mm -hmm. One line on one side of the road, one line on the other side of the road, 15 feet apart. And uh, that's how the, the infantry moved. So we were moving to a new location, we being L Company. And we had some new, brand new replacements. And as we moved along this mud road, I knew we were getting closer and closer to the front. And uh, finally they stopped us and told us to scatter up in, in the woods for a while. We went up into the woods and as soon as we got up into the woods, I grabbed my entrenching tool off my belt and I started to dig a slit trench. And the medic took his helmet liner out and used the shell of his steel helmet. He's digging one too. We had five replacements. They're sitting there on logs and things, smoking cigarettes and razzing us. You know, you, you, look at the your beavers. And we didn't say anything because I'm just waiting till I can hear that first German mm -hmm. shell. Mm -hmm. The Germans will find us on this hill mm -hmm. and I'm trying to be underground <laughs> yeah. Yeah. as hard as I can. And uh, sure enough my ear picks up. If you lived there long enough you could tell where the shells were going. Mm -hmm. whether they were going overhead mm -hmm. or whether they were going to fall here. Mm -hmm. I, they kept getting shorter and shorter, the sound. So I knew they were zeroing in. Somebody had discovered us on that hill in those trees. And sure enough, one of them, bang, exploded right in the trees. And I rolled over into my hole that I was digging, as did my friend the medic. And I discovered I had two two rookies on top of them. <laughs> <laughs> and they shot, they know there was no more razzing us for digging. <laughs> now, fortunately, when I landed at Omaha Beach, the Germans were gone. But I could see all of the destruction was still there. The bodies were gone, of course. And I, but I landed the same way everybody else, you know, down over a, a, a side of a tanker mm -hmm. with one of the rope. Uh, then you waded in through the water. Yes, the went shore on our landing craft infantry and the front went down like you see in the movies. Mm -hmm. It was still in the water and we splashed out. Of course we all got our feet wet. <laughs> But uh, fortunately, nobody was there shooting at us. Yeah. It was only, I think, uh, 60 days, or something like that, after 
the actual landing had been made there. They cleaned up. All the dead bodies were gone. But all of the wrecked debris was still there. Vehicles, things like that. And all I could think of was, I'm glad I'm landing today and not a month ago. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I don't suppose there are too many of us who they were called, you know, in World War II they were called, or one, they were called doughboys. Do in World War II, we were called dog faces, GIs and dog faces, the infantry. Why dog faces, do you know? God only knows. <laughs> I have no, no idea. That's what we were called instead of doughboys. Mm -hmm. So that's my saga from World War II. Thank you. You're welcome.